Right. Okay, so let's move on to other new therapies, uh, of which there are a lot. Uh, on my first slide here, I just kind of listed uh, some of the new uh, drug uh, approaches that have been presented at ASCO and here, and will be also, some of them represented here at EHA, actually. And so we have combinations with approved drugs, Kyprolis, Dara, uh, pomalidomide, and then uh, the, the pre-approved, uh, well, we're hoping that these would be the next drugs that would be eligible for approval, Selenexor, Venetoclax, and is it Tuximab, uh, and more 202, both of those being other alternate anti-CD38 monoclonal antibodies. Uh, so if we just go through a little bit, um, as far as the approved drugs, I think there was tremendous interest uh, in the paper presented by Mary V. Mateos at ASCO, where she was looking at a once a week, a higher dose of carfilzomib versus a standard uh, twice a week dosing. Uh, this was the, the comparison, once a week carfilzomib plus dexamethasone versus the standard in the yellow here, uh, the lower dose, standard uh, dose twice a week. And I think that it was a pretty uh, decisive result in terms of both overall response uh, was better with the once a week higher dose. Uh, and then also that the remissions were uh, a little bit better with the uh, once a week do dosing. Uh, and uh, I think uh, surprisingly, uh, people were interested in what would yeah. be the toxicity. Uh, uh, toxicity uh, really quite acceptable, uh, 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 well tolerated. and so. Uh, I, I think that uh, there was, I would say, a little bit of surprise, but uh, a very positive surprise about these data. So, uh, uh, Joe, what, what do you think? Uh, will we be switching to once a week carfilzomib now? Well, I mean, I don't think we'd be switching necessarily everyone, but we've been doing it already. Yes, <laughs> I mean, yes, from that's some true. of the earlier studies, um, right. you know, the point here, of course, is a lot more convenient for the patient. So to come right. in three times in a four-week period instead of six yeah. is very attractive. I mean, if, even if the results had been even, I think people would have been happy, let alone um, by getting a higher dose of carfilzomib more conveniently, it actually seems to be better for patients. So I, I wouldn't say, you know, you're going to do it and you're going to like it, <laughs> like you're going to make everybody go to once weekly. But actually, I think this will be a step in that direction. Um, be interesting to see if it can ultimately from a regulatory standpoint, influence how we do future clinical trials with Garfield's. Right. Because that has been sometimes the difficulty. Uh, being, a, being a problem. Especially combining it with other IV treatments like daratumumab. Yes. But I, I, I'm, because this isn't the first trial ever in this, this is the largest one, but because we've seen the precursor studies, I actually believe in this. I think going to once weekly, I, I've had many, many patients and we've gone to, to once weekly. Very few of them want to switch back to twice weekly. Right. There is the occasional patient that may not feel as well. And then lastly, I was also encouraged, as you mentioned, that there really, or, that there really wasn't, it seemed to be not a, a big toxicity change. That yes. It, the, you know, the, the, one the, of the concerns. For uh, uh, cardiac and, and the like, really not a cardiac signal. Right, and, and that's something we've been monitoring pretty closely, that there's always been about that 5% of right. patients that seem to have some kind of cardiac issue with with um, uh, carfilzomib, thankfully only 5%, but still an important 5%. Right. And that number didn't really seem to change, change. when we went to once right. weekly. It's still right. in the same range. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting, and I think going to weekly dosing is something obviously our patients really want, um, yes. and it's nice to see the efficacy. Um, I, I think the other, to me, the other take-home message about this was that, and, and it's not paid attention to as much, is that the 2027 dose looks, in terms of PFS and response rate, identical to bortezomib. Ah, and I think, and I think, if so, when we think about carfilzomib as being more potent, mm -hmm. um, it really is the higher doses that get us that potency. The 2027 may be very similar to bortezomib in terms of efficacy, mm -hmm. clearly much, much lower peripheral neuropathy. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's move forward. Uh, just into some of the other combination studies, it was interesting to see carfilzomib combined with uh, venetoclax, and so venetoclax is uh, the BCL2 uh, inhibitor, which is moving forward in clinical trials. Uh, we have uh, responses in refractory disease. Um, we obviously have um, uh, data based on cytogenetics, uh, where uh, the, the, the efficacy is very good. Uh, obviously, with 1114, uh, patients with high cytogenetic risk, 
uh, you can see here, uh, obviously, 11-14, uh, the, uh, the, the best uh, outcomes. Uh, so I think that uh, we are, we're certainly uh, anticipating with this level of efficacy that uh, venetoclax will be moving forward, uh, uh, hopefully for approval in some setting. Uh, uh, so, so, Sagar, how do you view uh, this pathway? Will it be for this preferred group, the 1114, with the high BCL2 expression, or maybe more broadly? What, what do you see? Yeah, I think that's a great question. We, uh, Larry Boys at our group has done a lot of work on uh, predicting sensitivity to venetoclax in myeloma. Um, and uh, whether it's the ratio or the expression or uh, simply dependence on BCL2, which actually in vitro seems to be the best predictor. Yes. Um, and almost all of them are in the 1114 group, though not all 1114s are sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, and from in vitro analysis, at least, it appears that the best partner for venetoclax is dexamethasone. Uh -huh. um, and as an example, um, at this meeting, there's data that's being updated by Jonathan Kaufman on venetoclax plus dex yeah. in 11-14 positive only myeloma. Mm -hmm. And the last time he showed the data, the response rate was almost 70%. Okay. So that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yes. At ASCO, we saw data combining carfilzomib with venetoclax. The response rate looked pretty similar to that. Yeah. And so the question is, what is really being added by the bortezomib or the carfilzomib to venetoclax in a truly 1114 sensitive patient. Right, really, really good points. Uh, so, how are you being? Yeah, this? no, uh, I, th I, there is the, also the implication that um, there is a synergy with the proteasome inhibitors, right? right? right. Both uh, Valkate and Kyprolis. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, I agree with Sagar. I mean, in fact, I'm, I do that work with Jonathan Kaufman. Mm -hmm. We're on that paper together. So, I, I do think that in the 1114, using it as on its own or with, with DEX is, is probably going to be the first path. Yes. for this drug to be available to, to us in myeloma. Right. But I do think, although this study didn't look at it in quite as much detail, that original Philippe Moreau study looking at patients who were truly refractory to bortezomib and then were given bortezomib and uh, venetoclax together had a response. So I think it speaks to what you said right at the end. That there is something special about combining venetoclax and bortezomib or carfilzomib mm -hmm. together, right. understandably, by their mechanism. Right. Um, I'm not sure that we're quite convinced that that's the right combination. I, I hear your hesitation yeah. as well in how we use it, but I mean, to, to, I've had many patients who we put on the original trial, mm -hmm. you know, it failed everything else. Right. We're literally almost mm -hmm. in that CAR T cell realm, like heading towards hospice, and then we give them this pill, which thankfully most people tolerate really well, right. Right. who went into a deep and a long remission. So yes. it's exciting to have another option, another tool in the toolbox. Right, and also one that uh, is in this category of a precision medicine approach, right. Right. which is uh, really nice to see. Yeah. And lung 14 <laughs> happens in about 15% of Correct. myeloma patients. Yeah. So right. it's so, not every patient by any means, but right. it's not so rare that, 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 we, that there aren't a lot of patients affected right. by this. So, uh, and, I think and, it's, and I do think it's worth under, at least realizing, so when we started to look at sensitivity, um, and I think this is a paper that's about to come out, we've looked at probably 80 or 90 patients at our center. There were a small subset of non-1114s who were sensitive. Okay. Um, it's not a big number, um, right. and I'm not sure it justifies combination in, in all the 1114 yeah. negatives, but they were a subset that phenotypically looked different. They, they looked less like a plasma cell, mm -hmm. more like a B cell, and they tended to express CD20. Uh -huh. That's so, not uh, universal. Yeah, no, but that's a little that. different that. Yeah. than your average myeloma. Yeah, that's right. They're sort that's of right. myeloma with a dash of lymphoma. Yeah, yes, right. Yes, they yeah. have a little, right. uh, a little bit of uh, overlap. Yeah. Right, right. So we're going to talk briefly about a, an additional topic here, which was touched on at the at the summit. Just before we do, Brian, I will well, say you want that, to that, a final thing. Here? Yeah, I was just going to say that you know, okay. for folks listening in that you know, there are other drugs too that we're getting yes, very close absolutely. to seeing right. potentially coming to myeloma, namely Selenexor, right. uh, yes. which recently uh, got a favorable review for, for its future. And then uh, perhaps another CD38 antibody that you mentioned, Isatuximab. Uh, I'm presenting some work this week here at EHA for that, but I think that is getting a little bit closer. It still needs some time yet, but Again, in this realm of wanting more options, it's right. an exciting time to see that we may well have three more drugs added to our regimen within the next year or so. And then the, the, the approval of the, the pomalidomide uh, right. uh, Valkyrie Dex. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. yeah, very potent. We've been using that combination for a while, but it was nice to see in a big trial right, that right. it could be used because we always think of, we tend right. to think of pomalidomide as being used much later in the disease right. course. Here, they were using it really at first relapse. And yeah, so. Well, and I think that that's useful, particularly for a U.S.-based population, yes. because many patients are progressing on LEN maintenance, mm -hmm. and so all of those randomized phase three trials comparing LEN-DEX as the control arm to me, and this was a source of great debate at the meeting as well, right. have less meaning, that they're less valuable to me. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm with you, and uh, yes, so I think that... Uh, yeah, that, I came under fire for making that yes, comment, so I'm glad you agree with yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the, the PVD data are quite oh, useful. Having POM partners is really important in a post-LEN patient. Absolutely.